Okay. Uh, well, Professor Goodhart, thank you very much for being here. It's a great pleasure and honor that you take the time to talk to us. Um, maybe by way of quick introduction, who we are and what we're doing, right? We're a like working group of the Young Scholars Initiative of INET, and we're interested in inflation theory. So we're reading all sorts of recent publications on inflation and well, we have read your book. So we talked about your book last week. So we are prepared and uh, we have prepared a, a couple of questions right. and would be interested in understanding a bit the, the context of this book and also um, what your take on the status quo of inflation theory is. Um, so I, I don't know, can you maybe just to start um, and to warm up a bit, could you tell us a bit about the context of this book? So how come that you that you focus on demography, right? Is this the, the most straightforward focus point for a book in these times? Um, no, but um, I, I think our starting point was a, a belief that some, there were strong disinflationary forces in the economy uh, operating uh, well before um, the great financial crisis, uh, because the uh, central banks really didn't have much trouble in achieving their inflation target. Uh, the, they managed to do that while both nominal and real interest rates were trending downwards. So there was something else, it wasn't just monetary policy. Monetary policy certainly improved uh, after the Paul Volcker uh, and the adoption of inflation targetry and the central bank independence at the end of the 1980s, starting in New Zealand. But it wasn't just that there was an improved mon uh, monetary policy. There were other uh, disinflationary forces in the background. Um, and about, I think it now must be about eight or nine years ago, while both Manoj and I were working at Morgan Stanley, uh, we came to the conclusion that it was a mixture of demography and globalization. Uh, I, the, the positive labor supply shock uh, was the biggest that the world has ever seen in a very short period of time. The available labor force to anyone who could move their production from a high wage to a low wage area uh, more than doubled. Uh, and China is the most populous country in the world uh, and when they joined the world's trading system, uh, they also had an efficient government, whatever else you may think about it, it was certainly efficient. Um, and in the combination of efficient government, uh, they were a well-educated people. Uh, China had been the dominant power in the world economy for centuries before about 1750. Um, and the, the, the arrival of China onto the world's trading scene with the combination of technology and managerial know-how from the West led to a dramatic change. I mean, China's exports uh, went up from about less than three or four uh, percent of the world's exports uh, back in about 1990 to about 30% recently, or a third of world exports very recently, which was a very dramatic change. And the globalization led to uh, a number of disinflationary factors. First of all, uh, it meant that uh, the uh, uh, shifting production to a low wage economy cheapened those manufactured products. Secondly, um, employers in the developed world had a, a marvelous and credible threat to threaten um, uh, labor. Uh, you know, if you don't restrain your, your wage demands, we'll simply move our production to Eastern Europe, Hungary, Bulgaria, or Asia, China, Vietnam, or wherever. And that was a very credible threat. Moreover, the manufacturing shifted from the developed countries uh, to China and Eastern Europe. And the developed countries began to move their production into services. And labor in services is very much less well organized. Uh, this labor is scattered in small groups rather than gathered together in large numbers in single factories. And the power of trades unions declined dramatically 
uh, the, the number of those members who were trade unions uh, went down steadily as a trend. And the bargaining power of Labour really uh, was trashed. Um, and the strongest union in the UK uh, back at the beginning of the 1980s was the National Union of Mine Workers. Now the National Union of Mine Workers doesn't exist. Uh, the Union of Auto Workers, the UAW in the US, was a major power in the land back in those days. It, it isn't any longer. The power of trade unions has been greatly, greatly reduced uh, by the effect of China and globalization. And you add to that uh, the fact that demography uh, was becoming extremely favorable uh, in the developed economies. Uh, there was a baby boom between 1945 and 1955, which tailed off very, very sharply after that. Um, and that actually combined with the fact that uh, the age of marriage and having first children started to rise, a trend rise, uh, that actually meant that the participation of women uh, increased dramatically uh, over the period from uh, about the 1940s, uh, right up into the, the 1990s. So you had a much larger share of the population of working age, and of those of working age, uh, back before of the 1940s, half of them, uh, the women, were usually at home, not, not doing paid work, they were doing housework. Um, now, uh, a very large proportion of women are participating in the labor force. So the ratio of workers to non-workers, dependents of various kinds, increased very, very sharply. And inevitably, uh, an increase in the share of workers is deflationary because you don't hire somebody to work for you unless you think they're going to produce more than you pay them. Moreover, they've got to save for their own retirement and for other factors. So a, a worker is by definition disinflationary, while those who are not working consume, but they don't produce. And therefore, by definition, they are inflationary. And what you had over the period uh, from uh, about uh, beginning about 1980 until about 2010 uh, was a dramatic rise in the share of the population working and a fairly dramatic fall in the share of the population who were not working, who were dependents of one kind or another. And that again was strongly disinflationary. Uh, now all those two forces, the global and uh, the demographics, uh, really began to, re to uh, reverse very sharply around 2010. Um, now one of the problems is that the, the trend, the momentum of the weakening of labor bargaining power had been so strong that before COVID came about, we really didn't know to within about plus or minus five years um, when the, these underlying slow moving trend forces would bring about a, re a reversal from the disinflationary decades to the inflationary decades that are coming. Um, and, uh, we thought that we were pretty sure that the world would have become more inflationary by 2030, but we didn't know when. Um, now we think that COVID and the pan effect of the pandemic and the policies that this has generated will actually accelerate the whole process. Anyhow, that's enough in the sort of the background um, of what we were doing and why. Um, thank you very much. That was already very comprehensive. Um, so is it fair to say then that indeed the question about inflation lay at the core of your motivation to write this book and only from thinking about inflation you came to demography? Is that, that's a bit of a takeaway uh, from what you say? Well, now, or is that... um, I, we would, we would, we would, we were, um, we would, and we were looking for reasons for the disinflation uh, mm -hmm. of the, of the, those three decades. And it was further augmented, uh, really, and personal considerations are always important. And perhaps the chapter that we're proudest of in our book is chapter four, 
uh, which is uh, about the effect uh, of dementia and the effect of the neurodegenerative diseases of reinforcing um, the uh, problem of redu reduce reduction in the labor supply that is likely to come ahead. Um, both Manoj and I have uh, personal relationships uh, with those who are suffering uh, from dementia. Um, and uh, one thing that I must ask you, never believe that robots or AI or digital or any of these fancy things that are coming down the road uh, will do anything to reduce the need for human sympathy and empathy uh, to deal with the neurodegenerative diseases. If your mind is going, and that's what happens with neurodegenerative diseases, what you need is a sympathetic person uh, to be with you and help you through uh, the difficulties of uh, the activities of normal daily living. Uh, and um, the one feature about a robot is that its empathetic quotient, its ability to feel empathy is exactly zero. Um, and anyone who has been uh, had the misfortune to have to go to a dementia ward in a care home, uh, will know perfectly well that what people need uh, is personal human support. The, I, I, there, are things that, there are things that machines can do. There are sensors that can tell you whether someone is wetting their bed. There are machines that can help get a someone who is not capable of moving easily, get them out of their bed, into a wheelchair, out of a wheelchair, into a bath, out of the bath, back into the wheelchair, and so on. And those are helpful. But the idea that they can replace uh, human support is just not true. And that means that in dementia, neurodegenerative diseases, um, medicine has done wonders uh, at reducing cardiovascular problems uh, with statins and so on. It's done, it's increasingly doing fantastic work in dealing with cancer. It's success in dealing with neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, dementia of one kind or another, has so far, unfortunately, been virtually zero. That, uh, one of the things that we hope is that our book will be wrong because we see a fairly difficult life appearing for people of your age uh, and for central bankers, as a matter of fact. And one of the things that will make your lives better is if you don't have to look after your grandparents uh, and ultimately your parents because they deal with neurodegenerative diseases. At the moment, the ratio of funding uh, for medical research in cancer is something of the order of 20 times the funding of neurodegenerative diseases. And that, that dis displacement uh, needs to be um, dealt with really very quickly and massively. We need to shift a great deal of resources uh, into the dealing with the, 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 the it, there's a, a prediction that something like 10% of the Japanese labor force will have to be uh, shifted over to looking after the old. Um, and the dementia is an exponential function of age. You are incredibly unlucky if you get one of these neurodegenerative diseases before you're 65. Between 65 and 75, it's about one in three. Between 75 and 85, it's almost one in two. Over 85, by the time you're sort of 95, it's more or less everybody. And the fastest growing share of the population is going to be those over 85. Um, and COVID has done absolutely nothing to change that. In fact, COVID has done very little altogether to change the sort of underlying structural problems uh, of aging that the world is going to see. So your motivation is really also to, to um, 
show that these types of diseases have a much bigger macroeconomic uh, impact than, for example, cancer. So there's just a, a big misallocation of research money. That's uh, yes, it's a, and it's partly that I, because medicine has been so dramatically successful in raising life expectancy. Um, I you lot can actually now your expectation of life from where you are. Uh, is probably uh, that you will, all of you, can expect to live till you're over 85. Uh, when I was born, I think the average expectation of life was that I would live to about 70 to 75. And the expectation of life has really uh, increased dramatically over the last uh, half a century. And that has meant that neurodegenerative diseases which were pretty much the exception because everyone died earlier of one other cause uh, is now going to be the commonplace. And our societies are simply not geared up to deal with that. Uh, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a major social, um, medical uh, and economic problem, uh, the extent of aging. And now you connect these considerations to, to inflation theory, right? And if you, by, by mobilizing um, these um, considerations about the changing demographic structure. So do you understand that this is a critique about the state of the art of inflation theory in economics? Um, or what's your, yeah. what's, what's, what's your take on, I, on that I, state we, of the art? I, I, we have two major criticisms um, of uh, standard macroeconomics. The first major criticism that we have of standard economics uh, is that it, it is much too national, whereas we think that, um, particularly due to the extent of globalization, it ought to be much more, much more international and indeed as global. Uh, to give you a case in point, uh, the, there's a general belief now uh, that the Phillips curve has sort of disappeared. Uh, or has become horizontal or whatever. And that is very largely because people ignore uh, the effect of globalization and the ability to shift production abroad. So that what one really needs to look at nowadays is the availability of labor uh, on really a sort of global basis rather than looking at it nationally. If you just look at unemployment uh, in the USA, um, and try and do a Phillips curve for the USA, you will get things wrong uh, because you haven't taken into account the ability of American producers to shift their production abroad to, um, and, uh, to places like China. Uh, and we live in a global world, and in a global world, you have to take everything on a much more global basis. And my colleague, I don't know where Manoj has, has arrived at, I'll give him another ring soon. Um, but I, he has coined the rather nice phrase, China put the Phillips curve into a coma. Effectively, so, as um, people realized they could ship production uh, to Mexico, China, or wherever, uh, and the Phillips curve inevitably sort of ceased to function properly uh, because the available labor pool for very large groups of production was not just the US, it was international. And it was particularly, in this case, uh, in China. Um, so so uh, would you then, so, so you say either that the Phillips curve has temporarily disappeared, or would you say that if we think, of, if we really aggregate to the globe, then we would actually, we should be able to see it. Maybe we just don't have the proper data, but so yeah, I think globally, it should be which, there. It's a question of which parts of the globe. And the thing is that the, uh, I, one, of the, one of the issues uh, that we discuss in our book, or try to, uh, is that uh, although the working age population um, in the advanced world and in Asia, uh, or most of Asia, is going to start falling fairly rapidly as birth rates uh, have gone down, and the working age population, particularly in China, is going to start having gone up very, very sharply, uh, partly because of the baby boom, partly because of migration from the interior to the coast. Uh, what is now going to happen is the one child policy 
uh, led uh, the fertility rate in China to decline dramatically. And that is now bringing about a sharp reduction in the Chinese labor supply. Uh, and, but against that, uh, the population is growing very, very rapidly in Africa, and it is still growing quite sharply in India. Uh, and the, one of the questions that we face is could Africa and India sort of reproduce what China did? Um, and uh, there we argue uh, on a number of grounds that it, that it won't. Um, the, the reasons being that politically uh, it would be possible uh, for millions of Africans and, and Indians and some from Latin America to move to the developed economies, uh, but I don't think that that is going to be feasible both politically. Uh, immigration has been really one of the driving forces of populism, and I think the idea of having loads and loads and loads uh, of people coming over from India and Africa to the USA or to continental Europe or the UK is simply not a political runner. So could you take the capital to Africa and India in the way that it was done into China? And there the argument that we make is that the Chinese government, whatever else you may think about it, was very efficient economically. Um, and it was centralized. There was one central government. Uh, Africa has got 50 different countries, a very large number of different languages. There's Francophone Africa, there's Anglophone Africa, um, and they don't have the same uh, traditions of administrative competence uh, that the Chinese undoubtedly had. Uh, India is, I think, likely to be more successful but even there, politics gets in the way because the, the state and the national government frequently tend to be at loggerheads and there is less central drive uh, for uh, economic growth, which was a centerpiece of what Deng Xiaoping um, and the Chinese government did and did extraordinarily successfully. Um, and we don't think that, uh, that India is likely to pull off the same trick or to do it so successfully um, uh, as China did. But again, we could be wrong. I, right? yeah. Nobody knows the future. So, so you said you have uh, two major criticisms, right? So the first one was uh, that it's that, that standard economics is too national. And what was and the second one? The second one is they look too far too in the far too short into the future. Uh, the okay. point here is that. Um, the, the uh, forces that we're talking about, uh, globalization and uh, demography, uh, operate most of the time, not necessarily all the time, but most of the time very, very slowly. It's a trend rather than a sort of cyclical force. So mm -hmm. that if you're looking one or two years ahead, what you do is you take effectively uh, demography and the supply of labor as a fixed factor, as given, rather than as sort of a changing, because it changes so slowly. Uh, this can alter, and indeed the, the sort of the economic disagreements between China and the USA uh, may be an example of an occasion uh, where the change is sufficiently short, dramatic and quick uh, to influence e um, economic forecasts. But as a generality, all the macroeconomic forecasts tend to be one and two years out. And the underlying slow trend forces of demography uh, and then again, globalization simply get uh, assumed away. They get treated as a constant. So it's, that, it's... Uh, so that if the, 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 the great, the enormous proportion uh, of work in macroeconomics uh, looks in terms of national data one or two years ahead. And this misses out all the global forces and it misses out all the longer term underlying trends.
it's it's very interesting because when I read your book, I I was surprised about the extent to which it was really forward looking and not so much analyzing past uh, evolution. So I thought this is really a bit almost speculative, maybe for an academic book. But so from what you say, that's that's it's sorry. Anything to do with the future is speculative. Exactly, nobody exactly. Knows, nobody knows. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, I know. It's it's that, that's a cheap criticism, right? But so you you really you, you see it as a way of also critiquing established forecasting models by really yes. having this kind of long durée view. That it's that, not that forecasting models. Uh, a, therefore, are all far too national. Yeah. And B, they don't take account of the slow moving underlying trends, which yeah. are basically demographic, though the, the uh, globalization, or rather, it's now somewhat moving into reverse, uh, yeah. is another. Okay, so I, I would like to zoom in a bit to the to your arguments about inflation now, right? So we specifically focused on chapter five last week. Um, um, so one thing that struck me is that so the key to your argument is really the, the connection of inflation to this dependency ratio, right? Um, yeah. And so I, I, I mean, I, I don't find it unplausible, but as a devil's advocate, I could say this is a bit of an ad hoc assumption, right? And you, you, but but it's really the the, the main argument, uh, or that's the main assumption you construct your argument around it. So well, um, I remember that uh, the. The development of the available labor supply uh, to those in the advanced economies, there has never ever been 30 years as there were between 1980 and 2010 that led to such a huge expansion. The only other occasion in history that I can think of that has an equivalent change in the labor supply it goes in the opposite direction. And that was the bubonic plague, which mm. hit Western Europe, and I think it was the 14th century. And it cut the available labor, and it cut the sort of working population almost by half. And you got a major change in real wages um, and in the relative power of capital and labor uh, as a result of the bubonic plague. And this is, in effect, the exact opposite of, of that. This is an occasion uh, where suddenly there was a huge availability of labor. Uh, and you, you know, Eastern Europe and China, relatively well administered, they were pretty well educated. Um, and I have, I have an enormous admiration. I the, you know, the people in Eastern Europe and people in China are, are as good as anybody. And uh, with good administration, good education, um, you can go a hell of a long way. And suddenly these people were available to join in the world production process. Yes, um, so, but so, uh, okay, I'm, I'm now inclined to ask are there, so you, you give the example of the bubonic plague. Um, are there any economic history studies that look at the relationship to inflation? I'm not sure if it really makes sense to go that far back and at the monetary system at the time. But so are there any historic precedents that very much support your assumption about this very strong connection between inflation and the dependency ratio? Um, there are one or two. I know I'm, I'm, um, I know. I, get, I can't carry everything in my memory, <laughs> certainly at my age. Um, not that I, have, thank God, I don't have a neurodegenerative disease, um, but yeah, there are a few. There's somebody called Takats, um, and I can't remember who else have studied this. There are some studies. And one of the problems has been that demography has actually been almost written out of macroeconomics uh, in sort of recent decades. Um, I think Alex has some some very specific questions also now on the on the inflation uh, chapter. Yeah, so this is related to the dependency ratio. Uh, you said earlier that you don't hire someone to work unless you know they're going to produce more than they cost, and that workers are by definition disinflationary. Um, so I want to push back on that a little bit um, because economic policy changes what's profitable, right? 
um, and employers respond to incentives. So if the government changes those incentives to maximize employment, then can we really say that those workers are necessarily productive? Um, so I guess the question really is to what extent is there an overlap between workers and dependents? If we've been using economic policy to boost employment and wages for a reason other than the product of the labor, then does that make the labor market start to function more like a social su support program? Uh, and then that if, yeah, go ahead. Very inflationary too. Um, I, uh, I take a particular example that was in the news this week. Uh, the increase in the unemployment benefits uh, in the United States have been so high uh, that uh, quite a lot of people are refusing to take up relatively low paid service jobs so that uh, it may well be that inflation will start at a higher level of unemployment than people now think uh, in looking at the Phillips curve relationships. Yeah, so I guess the question is how much room is there to ease off um, pro-employment policies and transition into more direct uh, government provided uh, social support as people retire? Uh, well, I'm the, I'm the difficulty with social support is it's highly desirable and very beneficial socially, uh, but it doesn't produce much in the way of goods and services. So that the more that uh, labor is channeled into looking after the aged or other sort of desirable social activities, uh, the fewer the workers are available uh, to produce goods and services. And so actually the more inflation is likely to occur. And one of the things that we argue in our book uh, is that we need to have uh, a lot of labor uh, released from repetitive jobs by technology, by AI and whatever, in order to shift them over to looking after the old, uh, where, as I said, robots just won't work. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, I guess the question is, um, to what extent is, is a lot of the work being done in our economy um, kind of a form of make work, um, just indirectly through uh, through uh, pro-employment, pro-job, pro-wage macroeconomic policies? Well, the more it's just make work, the more actually inflationary the situation is likely to be rather than less. So I would say that that is actually reinfor would reinforce our position. So I agree, but the more make work we already have in place right now, the more room there is to eliminate that make work as people- um, Yeah, you know, um, I, I, that's certainly true. Uh, but on the other hand, if you do manage to eliminate the make work, uh, we're going to need it because it's not going to be make work to look after the old, it's going to be necessary. They need it. I can tell you, um, we do need it. We old. Uh, and if I, if, I, if I can persuade you of one, one thing, uh, you can do what you think what you like about interest rates and inflation. What I really want to persuade you about uh, is that uh, we're going to live in a world with a, a many, many more old. We're going to live in an aging society and that our uh, social and economic system is not yet geared up properly, has not realized the extent uh, of problems that uh, medical, social and otherwise that having an aging society will bring with it. And he's going to persuaded me of that, yes. I think uh, Bruce had a question, you uh, posted it. Bruce? Yeah, hello there, sorry, I was, I was trying to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> um, Professor Goodhart, I was just curious, um, you, you touched upon it here a minute ago, and, and I also got the point uh, listening to a podcast that you were in recently, where you said a lot of uh, modern day economists, you know, don't really pay attention to, to the global issues, like, for example, the Phillips curve, you said they look at, they look at um, you know, national economic issues and not, not global. But my question sort of back to you, even though I, I gather you're probably not uh, giving specific advice on what governments should do. But I guess my question really is that, like what should central banks or, or you know, government uh, finance ministries 
do when it comes to things like you know trying to manage their own currencies, for example, or inflation rates domestically. Um, but but something like U.S. dollars is, is essentially a global currency. So almost back to like you know the Triffin dilemma from the '60s. What, what's the what's the answer to how to handle that? Um, well, first of all, I would like to say that I, actually central banks have that have done pretty well uh, in the sense that uh, the inflation rate uh, since about 1990 uh, has averaged slightly under 2% and has really been remarkably stable over that period. And you can't ask for more than that. And again, I would like to emphasize that the period that is described as the great moderation uh, from 1990 uh, until the great financial crisis in 2008-9 were probably the um, greatest, best sort of 17 or 18 years in the history of the world. Uh, there was steady growth, low inflation, a vast proportion of the world's population was taken out of poverty, um, and it was it was it was a, a dramatically good period. Um, I think that uh, I'm worried that uh, that various forces uh, are going to make life a great deal more difficult uh, for central bankers uh, over the coming few years um, uh, because the the turnaround in, in demography and in globalization uh, and globalization uh, has been set back not only by uh, various political inevitable disagreements but also by the response to uh, the COVID uh, pandemic itself and the effect of the COVID pandemic has been that virtually every country uh, has tried to grab as much uh, of the vaccines for themselves as they could, which has meant that each country now wants to have at least one or two pharmaceutical firms in it capable of making vaccines in a future occasion. So the idea that you can offshore uh, an essential industry like pharmaceuticals, say to India, uh, and is now, I think, um, uh, been reversed. I, it, rather than sort of offshoring to cheap production areas, uh, the cheapest form of uh, supply chain, there's going to be onshoring of those industries which are going to be regarded as uh, 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 as particularly essential. I'm sorry, I've slightly lost the thread of what your initial question was. I do apologize. Uh, I think I think you addressed it. Thank you very much. Um, now, Tasha has a question. Hi, fantastic to, to be part of this conversation. Um, you've, you've mentioned that uh, life is going to be very difficult for central banks with demographics and, and COVID and globalization. Um, and I was wondering how you see these factors interacting with other more long term um, uh, factors like climate change and the associated environmental degradation um, that pose supply shocks, labor shocks, et cetera. Um, well, so kind of how, how central banks will, will manage all of these challenges. Well, we didn't deal with climate change in our book, not because it's not um, important, of course it's hugely important, but because um, a book has got to have a degree of focus and a huge number of people were writing on climate change and we were not particularly expert on climate change. Nor in our book did we really focus on technological developments, AI um, and dig digitalization. Again, because we weren't experts on technology. Uh, but uh, what I would say is that um, the, the need to deal with climate change is going to require a fairly considerable amount of investment in the short run. Um, I know you, you, you know about uh, President Biden's uh, proposal on infrastructure and climate change proposals, and it's not inexpensive, it's, it's pretty expensive. And that is going to require uh, additional taxation to deal with that. Uh, so that that does not lead to much more inflationary pressure. 
But the more you have to raise taxation to deal with the climate change investment, uh, the more people are going to worry about the rate, the increased burden of taxes. And one of the problems that you lot are going to face, uh, which I didn't, I was on the, I was on the very beneficial, is that you lot are going to be a smaller group of workers dealing with a much larger group of dependents, basically the old. And the old are expensive because of Medicare, medical support, personal care, care homes, and pensions, and so on. So there's a huge redistribution, and the burden of that will largely fall on you. Um, and there's going to be a concern about a greater weight of taxation coming down the road. Um, and one of our, again, our, our views in the book is that increasing taxation is always politically unpopular. Um, and the polit politicians of any stripe, I don't care whether you call them left or right or whatever, are going to find it very difficult to raise taxation sufficiently to deal with the problems of aging and climate change simultaneously. And it's because we think that they won't be able or prepared to raise taxes sufficiently uh, that we're likely to go on having uh, deficits and high debt. Um, and this is likely to lead uh, to inflationary pressures. And it will be very difficult for central banks to deal with that because when the debt ratios are so high as they are at the moment, if you start pushing up interest rates, it not only increases the fiscal burden very quickly and very sharply, uh, but also it impinges on, on firms and firms are already heavily indebted. When interest rates go up, uh, it's all too easy uh, to push the economy back into recession. And that benefits nobody, uh, because if you've got a recession, tax revenues go down and everything gets worse. So that's, again, one of the reasons why this combination of the problems of an aging society and a society that needs to deal with climate change is going to make for very, very difficult macro policy issues down the road. Um, and we're going to have to do it. Sorry. And there's no question uh, that we're going to have to deal with climate change um, uh, because it, it is such a, a enormously important issue, but it's not going to be cheap. In um, I have another like follow up question also again but focusing on on your arguments on inflation so what 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 I noticed is uh, uh, oh I was a bit surprised about the absence of uh, money or the monetary system the mechanisms of the monetary system I would have expected uh, a bit of a greater focus uh, coming from you in in this book so I, I was wondering why uh, how come and um, following up on that so no way. I mean, you, 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 Sorry, your, your 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 story is basically that the that the disinflation tendencies are exported from China to the West, and I mean yeah. that 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 requires a lot of infrastructure, right? You need to have a functioning international monetary system and all the big, I don't know, uh, hyperinflation stories we had in the 20th century also were connected to a breakdown of that. So I, I'm just interested in how you how you see the connection here, right? So to which extent could um, could the structures and the realities of the international monetary system have an impact on your story on, and on inflation? Well, within America, the US is still such a central country that what happens in the US is enormously important to the international monetary system to a degree that, for example, the uh, euro and the pound and the yen are not. Um, and indeed, uh, we do think that the uh, macro policies, including the monetary policies that have been adopted to deal with the COVID pandemic, are likely to push up inflation in the short run. Um, and uh, we think that that combined with the increasing shift to a more labor shortage will mean that uh, uh, the inflation will not return 
sort of the two percent norm uh, after the immediate blip of inflation. Uh, let me put it in monetary terms. Um, in the US, the broad money supply uh, has been rising now for uh, more than a year at about 25% per annum. And it looks as if that is likely to continue for at any rate the next six months. Uh, now that's almost unprecedented during peacetime and wartime is rather special. Now in the short run, it's had very little effect uh, because there's very, been very little that people can go out and spend their money on uh, other than some more manufactured goods that you can order through Amazon. And you can't go out and um, at least a lot of people have not been able to go out and go to restaurants and theaters and things like that. Um, and we think that uh, sort of as life returns to normal, uh, the increased savings ratio and the increased monetary availability, increase in the money supply, uh, will result uh, in um, uh, inflation, at any rate in the short run, uh, really rising really quite significantly. As you probably saw, the latest CPI figure in the US went up to 2.6. Um, if it goes up anything under four, I think central banks will regard it as a victory. If it goes up between four and five, there will be a lot of heart searching, uh, but they will still say, well, let's wait and see. If it goes up beyond 5% uh, at any stage over, between over the next year, uh, there will be a great, great deal of concern and worry and uh, quite how the Fed might re react to that, I don't know. Um, in the very short run, uh, the US economic recovery is actually stronger by quite a long way than that in Europe and the UK and in most other parts of the world. And a strong US recovery uh, is actually likely to um, lead to the US dollar remaining quite strong. Uh, but the, if the inflation starts rising really quite sharply, then it will go the other way. The US dollar will weaken. So it's actually quite hard. It's always hard to uh, forecast what is likely to happen in the foreign exchange market. Um, unless you're either extraordinarily lucky or a great deal better economist than I have ever been, uh, don't try and either predict the foreign exchange market or bet in it because you're likely to get it wrong. Uh, and it is very difficult to see whether the US dollar is likely to strengthen or weaken uh, over the next year because growth will probably strength, real growth will probably strengthen it. Inflation will probably weaken it. And which of those will be stronger over the next 12 months is anybody's guess. Yes, thanks. Um, I think Ravi, uh, no, sorry, uh, Nibi has a question uh, related to, to, to that. Like to uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I have a question about uh, central banks' uh, policies, monetary policies. So as you know, uh, the central banks currently are currently implementing very smooth monetary policy by keeping interest rate at a very low rate. And do you think do central banks really take asset bubbles and higher inflation rate into account. And uh, how long it will take to, I would say, implement this very smooth monetary policy um, as it will be very, I would say, um, critical problem um, regarding high inflation rate uh, and asset bubbles. Uh, well, monetary policy is a rather difficult stage. The point is that monetary policy measures, interest rates, growth of the monetary aggregates, however you like to name it, actually has its greatest effect on assets. Yes. But monetary policy is meant on assets and asset prices. But monetary policy is meant to affect the price level of goods and services. That's its target. 
So although its target is sort of CPI, RPI, the goods and prices of goods and services, the greatest connection of monetary policy is actually with asset prices. Um, and monetary policy uh, in pursuit of trying to achieve uh, an inflation target of 2% in the context that has been very disinflationary has been so expansionary that asset prices uh, have reached very high levels indeed. Yes. Uh, and the monetary authorities have, have, have essentially ignored that. Um, and they're going to go on ignoring that unless of course there is a financial crisis uh, and given that the debt ratios are so high and asset prices are st so historically high, any attempt to raise interest rates either sharply or by any larger amount could well bring about a, a very sharp decline in asset prices. And then I think that they would have to reverse tracks. So that there's been a sort of a bit of a problem uh, in that central banks have reacted to sharply declining asset prices, but not to sharply rising asset prices. And there's a particular problem that I would note uh, about the way that the CPI is measured. In the CPI in the US, housing enters quite largely, cost, housing costs enter quite largely. Uh, but the way housing costs enter into the CPI is through the rental values. Now, housing prices uh, in the US and in a lot of other countries like my own have been rising very sharply and are likely to go on rising uh, in the present context over the next year or two. But rentals have actually stagnated. Uh, if the CPI measured housing through housing prices rather than through rental values, what you would find is the CPI would already be well over 3%. So the way that you measure housing for the price index is actually, and particularly at the moment, extremely important. And it, it's a sort of technicality that most people are not aware of. Yeah, I guess, uh, so one, one, one message that you have here is that just inflation is just not at all um, clearly to define. Would you agree to that? So it really depends Absolutely. on how you ask, and Absolutely. this is what you find. So. Exactly. Uh, but remember in economics, nothing yeah. is really clearly defined. Well, that yeah. when I say that. And things like the GDP and, and productivity. And if you actually try and study how they measure productivity uh, in, for example, education or health or the banking system, uh, and you really go into the nuts and bolts of it, you'll be surprised how arbitrary uh, the measurements are and how arbitrary some of the estimates of productivity are. I mean, I'm, people worry about GDP figures to the sort of uh, one tenth of one percent, but then they, they just are not that accurate. Um, the things like uh, the, the, the general happiness, the feeling of well-being and so on uh, that you have in society is not well measured uh, by our statistics. And they may be the best statistics we've got, um, but uh, never ever take statistics at their face value. And they are, the, they are very dodgy. I have, uh, thank you very much. I have one additional question, which, uh, relates to, to, which relates to chapter 11. So chapter 11 is where you discuss the debt overhang, right? So, I mean, this is maybe one of the, also one of the, the, uh, the key analysis that you present. So we, we have a massive debt overhang in the, in ho for households, for companies, also for, for the government. And you discuss several options of getting rid of that debt overhang. And you also mention inflation as one of them. And so since, since I want to like structure this discussion around your take on inflation, so I, I wonder, is it possible to create it on purpose, right? So I, I, I sensed it a bit, but then elsewhere in the book, you write, well, that oh, my, my take on what, you, what else you write in the book is that actually we're not really able to control it, right? That, that there's just this 
the sense or central bankers think that they are able to target certain inflation rates. But at the end of the day, it depends on a number of other factors, including demography, which are not really so key to um, most economic models. So uh, would we be able to really manufacture inflation to get rid of this well, uh, we, high debt I, rates? We really don't want to manufacture inflation. And the other thing that is important is that if anybody came out and said, I want inflation to be higher, uh, and they were in a position to try and influence that, say that somebody in the Fed or the government said, I want inflation to be 5% rather than 2%, it wouldn't do that much good in terms of getting rid uh, of the debt overhang. The reason would be that inflationary expectations would rise in line, um, and that would mean that interest rates would rise uh, nominal interest rates would, would certainly rise in line. Um, and that would mean that uh, the, the short-term debt would have to be rolled over at a much higher rate. The inflation that actually um, gets rid of your debt much easier is the inflation that is unexpected. So the interest rates haven't risen in line when the inflation occurs and therefore you get a reduction in real interest rates. Um, and that actually is, is beneficial, uh, particularly, of course, to the debtors. Thanks. I think uh, James has a question. Yes, I do. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so my question is particularly in regards to Japan. Earlier on in the meeting, you, you mentioned Japan and that you uh, you studied it uh, a little bit and you, you're aware of its demographic trends. Um, so Japan's, a, I think, a pretty good example of maybe where these Western countries are heading demographically. They're a very old uh, society, if you will. Yep. Um, but there's been no inflation pressures. Yep. Uh, in fact, the, the country, they've been begging for inflation for over two decades. Um, if inflation was so easy to be caused, why not just print the money? Well, they kind of did within the last couple of years. Uh, they had a very large national debt, which I believe uh, maybe about five minutes ago, you, oh, okay, it's, it's all about this. Uh, all right, anyways, um, so, Anyways, uh, they paid off a quarter of their national debt and again, no inflation. I haven't read chapter nine. Apparently it's all about this. <laughs> it is. We just, there was we just a, a, there's yeah. a specific chapter in the book on Japan because yeah. Japan was, was clearly the main counter example. And Japan, mm. the, I, the main sort of counter to our book is why, do, you know, if, if demography uh, is so important. Why didn't it happen in Japan? Why did you not get inflation in Japan? Um, and I think I mean, our answers are as follows. The first mm. one is uh, Japan is a very close neighbor of China. Um, okay. And when China was disinflating the world, uh, it was disinflating Japan as well. Again, it's the argument that you mm. should look just at internal, um, as my colleague, Manoj always says, most of the studies of Japan assume it is a country in autarky. In other words, it's a country all by itself. Well, it wasn't. I mean, Japan had very closely related to China. Um, and uh, the J Japanese uh, industry uh, shifted an enormous amount uh, of their production uh, to other Asian countries, mostly to China. Uh, there's a great deal of outward FDI into China, a great deal of shift of production, great deal of profits, a great deal of investment uh, went from manufacturing in Japan uh, into China. Uh, and that again meant that uh, like in the Western countries, uh, there was a very large shift of, um, uh, of work, the workforce out of manufacturing into services. Uh, and in services, a lot of them were part-time. Uh, there was very little uh, labor bargaining strength. Um, 
the Japanese tendency is not to, um, when things are not doing so well, is not to uh, uh, make people unemployed, but to put them on much lower hours, um, much less hours for part-timers. Um, and that occurred so that the, the low unemployment figures that you got in Japan uh, hid a sharp reduction in labor bargaining power uh, because of the shift to services and part-time working. Uh, so that the sort of the, the economy was never as sort of strong as the basic unemployment figures uh, indicated. Moreover, um, the, the Japanese monetary policy uh, was aimed at increasing the reserve base of the commercial banks. It did not increase monetary growth rapidly. Uh, if you actually look at the broad money figures uh, over the last two decades, they did not increase very sharply because in the, the, they never managed to get their commercial banking system <coughs> to extend large volumes of loans uh, because in a way with interest rates so very low, that the Japanese banks were only too happy to absorb a great deal of additional reserves uh, and help hold them uh, with the BOJ. Uh, so the monetary policy was not that expansionary. In fact, during the COVID crisis, uh, Japanese money supply has gone from the sort of average of about 4% or 4.5% up to 9%. So in the last year or so, their monetary growth has doubled. And that may well mean that uh, we may get some resurgence of inflationary pressures um, in, in, in Japan now. And the final point I would make on in Japan uh, is that um, uh, they they not doing so badly. If you look at um, uh, output per worker, uh, what you will find is that output the output productivity productivity per worker in Japan has actually grown at a far faster rate. I'm sorry, I don't, the teller. Oh, good, it stopped. Um, that uh, productivity per worker in Japan has grown faster than almost any other developed country, considerably faster than the US. Um, and if we look at productivity per worker, figures, um, Japan has actually led the advanced world. Uh, and when countries, uh, notably the continental Europe uh, and indeed China, uh, are facing a sharp decline in working age population, uh, they're going to do, they're going to be, they'll have to do well to, to, if they, if they manage to to do as efficiently as well as Japan has done. Thank you very much. I think we've reached the end of our hour. Um, is there any urgent question that needs to be asked? Um, Can I drop in one quick one? Yes, yeah. sure, ask here. So thank you for this uh, great talk, Professor Kotard. Uh, coming from the, and this is towards the, the last two chapters of the book, the, the, the fiscal issues are really interesting to me, not only because I'm sitting in the fiscal council, but I, I think for the world, we are facing this paradox of the central banks not even been able to raise interest rate because it will kill the you know, finances of municipalities and even the, the, the governmental huge uh, additional debt. Uh, and then if we move forward with your idea of the, the care workers with all the unemployment, if the, the government in a stylized uh, model will employ these unemployed people from the COVID to take care of the, the care work, additional care work of all the sick COVID and, and neuro patients, you know, your quick thought on this and, and whether the, the, the central banks may be constrained because of the fiscal issue, not being able to raise the, the uh, interest rate. That's absolutely so. And we think that um, uh, the, 
central banks have not been under any pressure at all over the last sort of uh, 30 years from 1990 when they started central bank independence and inflation targetry because interest rates have been coming down steadily. And when interest rates are coming down, they're the best friends of ministers of finance because it makes life very easy. And if you like it, look at the debt service ratio, what you find is that over the last 30 years, the debt of the public sector, public sector debt ratios have gone up much faster than ever before in peacetime, very largely under the influence of an aging society. But it's had no effect on debt service ratios because interest rates have gone down equally as far in the sort of downwards direction. So central bankers have actually managed, if you like, to make life easier for ministers of finance. But interest rates can't go down any further because we're at the effective lower bound. Uh, and moreover, if uh, I happen to be right um, and inflation is going to go up and stay up, not enormously high, but higher than central banks want for their target, then they will have to start raising interest rates and that will bring them directly into conflict with ministers of finance. And um, our argument is that ultimately, uh, the government is much more powerful than central bankers. Remember, uh, there was a question about how many divisions does the Pope have? You know, how many divisions do the central bankers have? And, and when push comes to shove, uh, the government will tell their central bankers what to do. And if they don't like what the central bankers have done, they will fire them. Um, I mean, this has happened in countries like Modi's India, uh, Erdogan's Turkey. I know it hasn't happened yet uh, in sort of many de major developed economies. But remember, there hasn't been much of an occasion yet when the central bankers have wanted to raise interest rates to maintain their inflation target. And the politicians have not wanted interest rates to rise, uh, both for fiscal and for political reasons. So again, we think that the future decades are going to be very, very much more difficult for central bankers than they have been uh, over the last decade. Okay, thank you very much. I can report that Manoj has just sent an email and so apparently he had an emergency and had to go to the hospital. So we are, he's obviously excused and uh, Charles, please uh, pass on our best regards to him. Let's hope it will all be fine. Um, I, 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 I didn't know that. So I'll, I'll he, just, he just emailed it a minute ago, just okay. very quickly saw it. Um, all right, everybody, then um, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you so much for taking the time to respond to our questions. I can really, in case you haven't read it, and I can- And if you wanted to go on for a few minutes, I could, but I, it's up to you. Okay, okay. I, I, um, I thought my responsibility as the chair is to do some time management, but um, well, if anybody if has- a, to ask a question. Has I'm... another question, we, we, uh, it's a generous offer to go on. Um, Well, Sorry, I could certainly, Alex. certainly yeah. ask a few more questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I, I would like to know what you think about um, the, the various tendencies. How do you play them? The tendency in the long term will be for higher prices due to care and so on and so forth, the greening of the economy, public investment. And at the same time, the central bank will have more difficulty controlling uh, inflation. And at the same time, in the US, we see a burgeoning economy right now anyway. So all of this can be inflationary. But of course, a burgeoning economy can also lead to higher productivity, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So how do we how do you sort of play all these things out? The basic question I have to you, do you make a distinction between productive and unproductive, what it used to be called? Uh, is all work equally potentially inflationary or not? You seem to think that government funded care is inflationary rather than goods and services produced. So how do you, how do you see that? 
I'm sorry I haven't read your book, so maybe I would have a clearer, you wouldn't have to answer that if I had, but I haven't. Well, I hope that you will find time to read it. <laughs> um, um, and we do actually, and it, it, we do think that the world is going to be more difficult for central bankers and for policymakers, and that there will be more inflation. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we the the past uh, decade or two decades in most of our countries, the rate of growth of productivity has been pretty poor. Uh, we think that when uh, there is a shortage of labor developing, uh, that employers will be led uh, to invest more at home to raise productivity. So we see productivity increasing. Uh, so with productivity per worker will go up. Uh, although overall growth will decline because of the decline in the rate of growth of the working age population, um, the uh, growth per head or growth per capita will not do as badly. Uh, we do think that the uh, inequality, which has been a major factor in most of our countries, will as a result reduce. And the last three decades have been a wonderful period for those who've got capital and those who've, who've got financial assets, those who've got uh, real assets like housing. It's been pretty horrible for the, for the poor without any of them. We think that are going to go, is going to go into reverse. So the inequality will decline. Productivity per head will go up. Incomes per capita won't do as badly as we thought. It will be difficult, but it's, I, this is not sort of a disaster by any means. Uh, it's just that we have to be aware that there are factors around which are going to make policy uh, more difficult in future than it's been in the past, uh, will make inflation more of a problem, um, and uh, will lead uh, to greater macroeconomic difficulties than occurred during the wonderful sort of uh, 18 years or 20 years or so between 1990 and 2008. But do, Alex, I think you, oh, sorry. But, do be, but do be aware tax rates are likely to go up more or less everywhere and you'll all have to pay more taxes and you won't like it. <laughs> Alex. Yeah, so my question is, um, let's say uh, you're right, and the demographic reversal, um, you know, shrinks the global economy or causes um, causes it to stop growing as fast or something like that. Um, what, um, what's the smoothest way to transition to getting by either with uh, a shrinking economy or an economy that's growing more slowly? Is it to is allowing inflation smoother than, um, you know, reducing nominal incomes or raising interest rates more, that kind of thing? Like, there were some questions about this earlier, and you were saying, uh, you, know, you know, we never want to, um, to, to have more inflation or something like that. Um, but are there smoother options than, than higher inflation? Well, and that's one of the problems. It's not, it's, it's, it's not here to be all that smooth. Um, I would just mention, though, that, that, uh, the, the problem of an aging society is partly because the birth rates have gone down and the birth rates in the developed world are now be below the rate of sustainability. They're, but the rate of sustainability, as you know, is uh, 2.1 children for every woman. And we're now running at about 1.7 or 1 1.9. Um, and uh, those who are worried about the environment and those who are worried about um, uh, climate change and all that are actually welcoming the fact that uh, the rate of growth of population is slowing down. And the argument here is that the world can only sustain uh, a certain number uh, of humans. We tend to trash our environment and that a reduction in the sort of population growth is much to be desired. I was listening in on a, on a program about biodiversity uh, where the main thrust of the argument was we should send um, an enormous amount of contraceptive um, sort of aid uh, 
uh, to Africa in order to get their birth rate, which is still very high, uh, down to the kind of levels we have in our own economies. So it may well be that uh, having a longer lived, much slower growing uh, world is actually in the longer term what we need anyhow. Um, uh, on environmental grounds alone. Uh, so it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but we're, we are going to have to adjust to it uh, in a way that the argument in, in our book, um, and I would make it more generally, that our societies have not yet actually faced up to. This is going to lead to a whole series of social and economic problems uh, that the world is not yet really ready for. Actually, that might be quite a good point to end because yes, I agree that that actually is the sort of the, um, the I, if I have any message, it is that society has not yet adjusted uh, to the way that the population structure is going to be changing over the years in which you lot are going to be living. So you will have to be concerned about those issues. And look for solutions. Let's uh, hope indeed, that, um, indeed. good ideas coming up, up at some point. Indeed. You know, how to look after the old is going to be a very considerable uh, part of your lives. Um, Charles, thank you so much. Um, uh, as I said, um, a pleasure to, to have you. Thanks for sharing your insights, for even going 20 minutes beyond the scheduled time. And um, I wish you a happy and nice evening in, in the UK and all best regards from Boston. Okay. Um, Good to thanks, talk. everybody. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.